Welcome to the opening of the 58th annual APAP NYC Annual Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the APAP NYC 2015 Conference Co-Chairs, Rachel Cohen, Kathy Edwards, and Daniel Bernard Rumain. Welcome everyone to the opening session of the 58th Annual Conference of the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. And we'd also like to welcome the colleagues who joined us virtually. Thanks to the HowlRound TV live internet streaming service, which we are embarking on for the first time this year. Welcome. And a number of additional conference sessions will be accessible through HowlRound, so check the website to find out what. It's deeply meaningful for me to be here in the role of conference co-chair, representing our presenter members. I began attending this conference over 15 years ago. The networks that come together at APAP NYC renew and energize my professional practice. This is where so many of us gather to be inspired by colleagues, old and new, and to see the work of artists who are shaping the future of our culture. Normally, you see two conference co-chairs standing here, someone representing our presenter members, that would be me, and someone representing our artist management members, and that would be Rachel. But this year, we added an artist representative to the mix. We have been so honored to have the input of the amazing creative talent that is DBR, also known as Daniel Bernard Rumain. Oh, thank you, Kathy. And I wanted to thank each of you for being here, being present, and such an integral part of this year's conference. As the inaugural artist representative for the conference, I am so pleased to be able to share my wonderful experiences as an artist who sees APAP as an important part of my creative life. And indeed, I'm here to be of service to you and your needs over the days and the fun-filled nights of our conference. Rachel, what do you have to say about this ever important occasion? Thanks, Daniel. Actually, this is my 23rd conference, and I am, yeah, and I'm thrilled to be here to share the inspiration, learning, networking, and all-around camaraderie that is only possible through an event like APAP NYC, which is why I find this year's theme, Together, to be quite relevant. So much has already been written about our theme, but it's also important to remind everyone of the following. Number one, it takes a village to plan an event for close to 4,000 people. 4,000 people. And the three of us were thrilled to be working with individuals you see on the screen. A primary goal of this committee is to make certain that today and over the next four days, there are many opportunities to share information and ideas that you can apply directly to your work. The more we learn collectively should make our field stronger for the future. We hope you will take advantage of the breadth and depth of professional development sessions and that comprise this year's program. And of course, the dynamic keynote speakers that will be with each of us today. Kathy? In addition to reserving some time for the professional development program, we hope you will also take advantage of many opportunities to meet new colleagues which could happen in the expo hall, or at a showcase performance, or in the cyber cafe. We know the next four days can seem daunting, especially to those of you who might be here for the first time. So please don't hesitate. Introduce yourself to us or to any members of the conference committee, to the APAP staff, to the APAP board. Also, there is an, in, an APAP information lounge across from registration. And if you need any specific information or are feeling lost or need some encouragement, come by and we will help. Daniel? 
Thank you, Kathy. And finally, it goes without saying that it would not be so easy for us to come together every January without the year-round effort of a hard-working APAP staff. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, they have been so responsive to our interests and concerns, and they themselves demonstrate the invaluable process of working together on the logistics, content, and management of this complicated event. We thank Mario, the staff, and especially the 100 plus volunteers who will be with us in the days ahead. Rachel? Here to share some of the highlights of what to expect in the days ahead, it is my pleasure to introduce the man with whom we spent so many hours with on the phone, APAP's Director of Programs and Resources, Scott Stoner. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, Mother. Hello, Father. Here at APAP, my alma mater. It's the first day, the opening plenary. The marathon has just begun like every January. PD sessions begin tomorrow. In the morning, 9 a.m. sharp, we will learn how to reach new markets. From millennials to boomers, there are targets. <laughs> Sunday morning, there's a new track. It's called Business Fundamentals. <laughs> How best practice in our industry depends on work together and as one family. Together at New York Hilton. Together at Charity to such short time to greet and meet and see it all beyond the expo hall. Petcha Kucha, noon Saturday. What a lineup with Mark Bamuti. On Sunday morning, it's worth writing. Ira Glass will dance perchance. Oh, how exciting. Later Sunday, more things to choose. Showcases Expo, more PD2. And what's new is global forums, a chance to share info ideas in tongues not foreign. Then on Monday, no time for sleeping. Five minutes to shine, the members meeting, the awards lunch, a time for stories. A time to recognize our peers, and yes, Midori. <laughs> Together, we'll all get through it. Together, to Tuesday morning, we'll hear Angelique and Joe, and on our way, we'll go. Good night, mother. Good night, father. I must make room for Chairman Jane Chu. But first, I must make a proper welcome. He's coming now. My boss is here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mario Garcia Durham. <laughs> oh. Now, that's actually the way Scott conducts himself at our staff meeting. So that is, he's very practiced. So uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Scott, so much. And congratulations, Scott, on such a terrific program. You are a true pro, and we all benefit from so much in your spirit of giving that you give to all of us here with your programs at APAP. So can I have a round of applause for Scott? <clears throat> I also want to thank the very hard work of our terrific conference committee. They are generous and dedicated souls who, together with our hardworking staff, make this annual convening possible. While in the Thanksgiving mode, please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude 
to the many sponsors who provide the critical resources we need to make an event this size so successful. I'm happy to report that 2015 marks our highest ever level of contributions from sponsors. That's great. Thank you. We um, have a lot to present this hour, but I'm going to take a moment to acknowledge each of these sponsors. First, thanks to support from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and the Wallace Foundation. Our diamond level sponsor this year is Live Nation. May I have a round of applause for them, please? Our platinum level sponsor is Starbucks Booking, and our gold level sponsors are IMG Artist and Open Three, Opus 3 Artist. And our, yay, yay. Listen, I do not mind acknowledging fantastic sponsors as much as possible. Um, our silver level sponsors are Alan Harris Productions, ICM Partners, CAMI, Canada Council for the Arts, and Patron Manager. And our bronze sponsors are Ticketmaster, KMP, the China Arts and Education Group, CAEG, FunClick, the Accidental Pervert, and the law firm of Fitzpatrick, Chella, Harper, and Sinto. So please, a round of applause for all of them. <clears throat> Great. So you can please scroll up. I'm using one of these for the first time, so bear with me. Um, I am heartened to um, be here and welcome you all, and thank you, thank you for making this annual pilgrimage to APAP each year. I would also like to welcome the newcomers who are joining us for the first time, and I would actually like the newcomers to please stand up if you can. Newcomers, please stand up. <laughs> let, let, me, let me be the first to welcome you and tell you that this is a field that really supports and helps each other and offers knowledge so freely. So welcome. We are gathered here together at APAP NYC to do, hopefully, a lot of business, see and book amazing artists, experience the myriad offerings of this great city, to see old friends, meet new colleagues, learn something, and share knowledge that may help each of us in our work and life. And most importantly, have some fun. So again, thank each and every one of you for your good work and for making the effort and spending your hard-earned resources to join your APAP community here in New York City. So thank you all. And now, and now I have the great pleasure of introducing someone who arrived on the scene in Washington just a few months ago, but who was chosen directly from the ranks of our presenting community to become the new chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. Since 2006, Jane Chu served as a president and CEO of the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts in Kansas City, overseeing a $413 million campaign to build the center. She has degrees in piano performance, music education, and piano pedagogy. Additionally, she has a master's degree in business administration and a PhD in philanthropic studies. And yes, she also has an honorary degree in music from the University of Missouri. Jane honed her skills as a community leader for over 16 years in Kansas City as an executive with the Community Foundation and other community development entities, which led her to her, which led to her appointment to build a new Kaufman Center. Additionally, you should also know that I had the pleasure of having Jane as an NEA presenting grants panelist a number of times during my tenure at the NEA. I found her to be insightful, forthright, and absolutely charming. It is an extraordinary pleasure for me to introduce to you our new chairman of the National, Arts for the National Endowment for the Arts, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Chairman Jane Chu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mario. 
I remember when Mario served as the NEA's Director of Presenting and Artist Communities, and he gave me that opportunity to serve on his citizen panels for presenting. We are so proud to know you, Mario, for the work that you're doing to strengthen the field of performing arts presenting. And I also want to thank the entire team at APAP for inviting me to speak with you today. It is such an honor to be able to return to this conference that I attended for so many years as a performing arts presenter from Kansas City, and I see a number of my colleagues here. It's great to see you again. APAP is really important. It recognizes the unique issues and the nuances in the performing arts fields, and it provides resources and grant programs to help us in our own professional development. And by its very nature, APAP has a network where we can meet other arts professionals, artists, and managers so that we can connect with each other and learn about how others address the same issues that we encounter. I've seen firsthand the challenges and rewards of your work, having just come from the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts six months ago, and I've seen firsthand what it's like to book those programs and handle cancellations, and I also understand the rush of excitement that comes from performing before a full house. And I also think that with the Performing Arts presenting, uh, it, it's a group effort. A single performance requires the coordination of dozens, if not hundreds, of people, from planning the programs to negotiating the contracts and booking accommodations, setting ticket prices, seeking sponsors and donors, and writing press releases and tuning the pianos and checking and rechecking the sound and lighting systems. And what if you're also presenting and producing? And how do you obtain the rights to creative works that have multiple owners? And what about presenting international artists? Those are questions sometimes just for a single performance. And so for those of you who have also been a part of an arts facility construction project, you know the amount of coordination that's required, and that was certainly the case when I was at the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts in Kansas City, ensuring that the many voices involved eventually spoke together in concert. There was our board of directors who addressed the specifics within the budget. And there was a community relying on the center to honor the performing arts and strengthen their city. And all of these were views that needed to be heard. So one day I'd be talking with drywallers, and the next day I'd be talking with oboe players. And some mornings I would wake up and I'd think to myself, I majored in piano in college, and I'm talking about low-velocity ductwork. <laughs> but I knew why I was talking about low-velocity ductwork because it contributed to the successful, sophisticated acoustics, and it elevated the performance environment that would bring out the best in artists and provide the quiet comfort for our patrons. And then opening night comes, and you remember why the arts play such a powerful and oftentimes transformational role in our lives. Presenting plays a big role in facilitating that transformational power of the arts working to coordinate an opportunity to celebrate the arts, bring people together, bring communities together. The arts in many forms give us a common entry point to understand each other. They have this power to bridge opposing perspectives between organizations, across disciplines. They have a rare ability to diminish societal divisions rather than exacerbate them. And when the spotlights appear on stage, the differences among us can fade away. And for a brief moment, we are together. And for those of us here today, this energy is very familiar to all of us. And it's likely a reason that we chose to pursue the work that we do. We have this opportunity through the excellent work that you do, whether you're creating art or facilitating its presentation, bringing audiences together, individuals and communities, so they can be struck by that full power of the arts. And so they can feel inspired by the music and the dance and acting and the setting. So they can have a window into other worlds or take pride as they watch the traditions of their cultures and other cultures played out on stage. The NEA recently held a convening about the impact of performances on communities called Beyond the Building. And you can find the video archive of the full day session online at arts.gov. But we're not talking just about the economic impact of the arts. Uh, that is, of course, a major and necessary consideration. 
but we don't re rely solely on the box office to tell us whether we're doing a good job. And at their core, the arts are about people and communities and about building connections and fostering value and stoking creativity. I remember when I was first feeling that full strength of the arts myself. I was born in Oklahoma and I grew up in Arkansas, 11,000 miles away from China where my parents were born, each making their lives in the United States as young adults after leaving their home country during the communist revolution. And while they spoke Mandarin to each other at home, I spoke English. They liked to eat bok choy and noodles. I liked to eat potatoes and corn dogs. And so they wanted me to assimilate and have a good life, which included the arts. And I dutifully took piano lessons, which I enjoyed, but it didn't really seem particularly significant at the time. But when I was nine, my father died of cancer. And that can be difficult for anybody to articulate the grief of losing a parent. But for a nine-year-old, this loss might entail words and emotions that had not, have not been fully developed yet, and this was doubly compounded for me since my parents spoke Mandarin at home and I spoke English. The arts helped me deal with this grief, and music became my refuge, and I felt soothed when I played the piano, no matter what type of music I would play. Music gave me this language that allowed me to express what I felt. And although I often felt like I had one foot in each of my cultures, music gave me a world that was fully my own. And it joined together the different pieces of my life, and I felt as though I belonged. Not only can the arts bring audiences and communities together, they can bring the disparate pieces of our own selves together. The arts give us a sense of personal understanding, of healing, and of reflection. And they can smooth out the differences between us and also within us. At the National Endowment for the Arts, we want to provide all Americans with the opportunity to come together through the arts, and we want to make sure that people experience these moments of value and of connection and of creativity early and often, because these are the moments that give life meaning, and they remind us of what's important. And it's by creating a richer space for these moments that make our communities and, in turn, our country a richer and more rewarding place to live. We need to work together to support the field and spread the work that you are doing for the American public. So together, we can come closer to building that dream where the magic that we feel when the lights go down is experienced by every American across the country in communities, large and small, urban and rural, in neighborhoods and colleges and community centers. I'd like for us to celebrate the creativity that is in this room today and the work that you're doing to provide opportunities for people to experience the arts. And so if everybody could stand. And uh, we have just come off a month of holidays. And I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Scott Stoner, who did just a wonderful job earlier, and also Colleen jennings Rogensack, and anybody employed by the National Endowment for the Arts, if you're on staff, come join me on stage. Uh, we want to, uh, we're coming off of holidays, and I know that you think you're done with holiday carols, but just let's sing one more together, the five days of APAP. <laughs> and this is sung to the tune of the 12 days of Christmas, and it's a truncated version. And so um, be clever as you know the uh, melody of the 12 days of Christmas, and we'll be jumping around. So for example, if you sing, five gold rings, you know uh, the type of melody that you sing when you hear the number five. And so let's get through um, the 12 days or the five days of APEP. Is everybody able to see the words somewhere? Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. On the first day of APEP, this is what I did see. Three keynote speakers, two conference sessions, and a room key at the Hilton NYC. Pretty good. Second. On the second day of APAP, this is what I did see. Five expo booths, four members meeting, three keynote speakers, two conference sessions, and a room key at the Hilton NYC. Very good. On the third day of APAP, this is what I did see. 
Eight different venues, seven artist managers, six deals of making, five expo booths, four members meeting, three keynote speakers, two conference sessions, and a room key at the Hilton NYC. We're getting there on the first day of the This is what you see. Ten cell phones ringing, nine cups of coffee, eight different venues, seven artist managers, six artists singing, five expo booths, four members meeting, three keynote speakers, two conference sessions, and a rookie at the Hilton and my C. One more time, on the fifth day of APAP, this is what I did see. 12 goodbye hugs, 11 showcase artists, 10 cell phones ringing, 9 cups of coffee, 8 different venues, 7 artist managers, 6 deals are making, 5 expo booths, 4 members meeting, 3 keynote speakers, 2 conference sessions, and the music of Angelique Oh, you were fast. You were fast. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and Happy New Year. I was fully prepared to say something snarky and funny, but that was so sweet. <laughs> You guys are great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Uh, we are so grateful to have your creative and inspiring message and singing that song to launch this year's conference and what a perfect embodiment of together. And now we have another special treat in store for you, a rare opportunity to hear from three young artists who are making a difference, bringing new audiences to the arts and their particular craft. We know that when it comes to creativity and the creative act, it is not always so easy to talk about it. So we naturally thought of someone whose livelihood is about just that. Exploring the nature and range of artistic expression with artists and bringing it to light through a public forum. Dr. Indira Itwaro is the executive producer and director of NPR Presents. She is also the founding executive producer of the Jerome L. Green Performance Space, which hosts live broadcast and tapings of WNYC's radio shows. The center's mission is to galvanize conversations around local and international life, arts, and politics in a transparent space between street and studio. Indira produced the American broadcast premiere of their Eyes Were Watching God, a radio drama to honor the 75th anniversary of Zora Neale Hurston's book. She has advanced degrees in cultural studies and dance education, and her undergraduate degree was in classical flute performance. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator for this evening's conversation, Dr. Indira Etwaro. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Fine. Wonderful. Happy New Year. I can't imagine anything more thrilling than sharing time and space at the beginning of the year with artists, whether you perform, create, or present. This is absolutely thrilling. Um, I want to set the tone and begin uh, tonight's conversation with a quote by Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist Catherine Ann Porter. The arts do live continuously, and they live literally by faith. Their names and their shapes and their uses and their basic meanings survive unchanged in all that matters through times of interruption, diminishment, neglect. They cannot be destroyed altogether because they represent the substance of faith and the only reality. They are what we find again when the ruins are cleared away. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome three extraordinary artists to the stage tonight, three extraordinary human beings, and what I like to call faith walkers, who have joined us for tonight's conversation. 
Oscar Eustace, artistic director of the Public Theater, has been quoted as saying, the fact that a kid who came from such incredibly damaging circumstances figured out how to respond to all of that with such huge spirit makes old guys like Spike Lee and me fall in love. Love was a word Mr. Lee also used. We love lemon. He's a very funny, poignant storyteller and a unique voice from the greatest borough. Brooklyn, good looking. But, Mr. Lee added, I'd like to say my man Lemon is the only Puerto Rican I've met who can't play softball. Roberto Clemente would be ashamed. Lemon Anderson is a poet, spoken word artist, and actor. He first garnered national attention appearing in Russell Simmons' Deaf Poetry Jam on Broadway, which won a Tony Award for Best Special Theatrical Event and netted Anderson a Drama Desk nomination for his writing. Over the last uh, over the past decade, he has performed in venues across the country from New York's New Yorican Poets Cafe to Hollywood's Kodak Theater. Please join me in welcoming Lemon Anderson to the stage. When she was 13 and said to be quite shy, this dancer followed the lead of her older sister, Erica, and tried out for the middle school drill team. She choreographed her own piece set to George Michael's, I Want Your Sex. <laughs> the closing move was a split head held high. The evening after the audition, she received a call saying that she had been named captain of the squad of 60. At 32, Misty Copeland is ballet's first breakthrough star in decades. The only African-American soloist with the American Ballet Theater, she's also featured in a video for the athletic wear company Under Armour that has been viewed more than six million times on YouTube. She was chosen to perform with Prince, to star in Swan Lake this year, and is a best-selling author for her memoir, Life in Motion, an unlikely ballerina. All of this accomplished by someone who was told she shouldn't pursue ballet. Ladies and gentlemen, Misty Copeland. <laughs> One writer wrote, the motion picture Selma its score comes from its subtlety of meeting racist fury with soft dignity as the jazz, soul, and spiritual rhythms of an oppressed black nation join hands with a measured symphonic approach, especially when detailing the movement's effect on a troubled marriage through soft strings and piano. Yet this is also a soundtrack that truly knows when to raise its emotional fist to shattering orchestral effect announcing an impressive new voice on the major scoring scene. Jason Moran, pianist, composer, and band leader, minds a variety of musical styles to create adventurous, genre-crossing jazz performances. In original compositions for his ensemble, The Bandwagon, Moran uses the human voice as a starting point for melodic structure, translating speech patterns into a musical language. More recently, Moran has collaborated with visual and performing artists and incorporated new technology and imaginative multimedia performances. MacArthur Fellows Jason Moran is now the artistic director for Jazz at the Lincoln Center. Please welcome Jason Moran. You must say Kennedy Center. And he's not reminding me of anything but that is the Kennedy Center, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Yes. Um, happy New Year to all three of you, and thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. An incredible group of artists we're here tonight with. Um, and this year's theme is Together which in modern language is used as an adverb. Let's create something together. Your organization is gonna to partner together with my organization. We're gonna bring music and dance together. But the actual origin of the word together is two words. It's two 
and then gather, G-A-T-H-E-R. It is a verb. It means to act. And so we're going to approach tonight's conversation from that place, looking how these three extraordinary makers of art have been working, creating, and serving on the front lines to gather communities together, new meanings, new audiences, ideas, bridge building, and more. And we're going to begin with three artistic narratives. So uh, the complexity of what's happening across the planet, in many ways this is a defining moment in our times and a battle cry for us to gather on new and unique journeys because we as artists and presenters of art do not exist in a vacuum. I want to start this conversation with the question and I'd love to hear from each of you. How do you define your role as an artist in the 21st century, 2015, on this American soil? And Jason, I'll start with you, and then we'll just go down the line. Great, 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 great. great. Um, I don't know, let's say I grew up in Houston, Texas, um, in a great community with a great family. Uh, a lot of support, uh, a lot of prodding, a lot of opportunity in my neighborhood uh, with my family. And, uh, but at 18, I knew I needed to leave that, that space that New York City offered a different territory and terrain that I thought all the artists I admired were kind of wandering the streets up here. All the great jazz musicians I loved were up in this city. And I wanted to be among those people. I wanted to see them at the grocery store, <laughs> you know? And so I left home. And I thought, as I grew as a musician, that the role of the artist was to actually leave the house a lot and to continually be outside of the space which you built, which was so comfortable for you. And within music, and especially within improvised music, what we rely on as improvisers is the relationship to respond directly to what you just said. Not even what you thought before you said it, but what you just said and how I want to respond to that. And in that changing of the, of, the, of the dialogue within the music, everything can change from playing one note to playing 10 notes to not playing anything at all. And all those options become kind of the options I think also for my audience as well, is that when they come to these spaces to hear an improvised concert of music, that the options are being laid out. Some are being acted upon and some aren't being. And then it's up to us, kind of as a collective unit, when we're gathering, right, to be together and then consider when we leave the theater, when we leave the space that we just experienced this performance in, then how does that play out in our life? As I get in my car, do I want to get regular unleaded <laughs> or, you know, really grade A gasoline? You know, like, that's what I want us to, that's what I want us as artists to. That's what I try to distribute to my people who come to see the show. And, and when you talk about comfort zone, that safe space, talk about how, how does the audience play into that when you're sort of pushing beyond that comfort zone as an artist? Well, the, <laughs> the beautiful part is you're really not supposed to know. And I will never know as, an, as the artist. I never know what anybody thinks about the music that, because I'm so, I don't know, I'm so, directed within how I have yeah. to make this, yeah. you know, that I never see the vision. I never get to experience it. It's one of the tragedies. It's not really a tragedy being an artist, but it's a tragedy that you don't get to experience it. Um, but, but we depend on the people out there to give us the vision back. And it's refracted because each one has a different viewpoint. It's like flies who have millions of eyes. That's our audience, you know, millions of eyes on you kind of giving you different viewpoints and vantage points on the work that we create. And that, that part is what I really depend on, is then later after the show walking out into an audience and somebody saying, wow, that was really depressing what I just heard. <laughs> but okay, and then the next person says that was really uplifting. You know, and then so all of these, you know, all of that becomes the, the thing that I depend on with my audience. Mm -hmm. Misty, let me ask you the same question. Defining your role as an artist in the 21st century, this complex landscape. Um, I would definitely say, I think I represent um, what America is and what Americans sh um, should strive for. And it's a beautiful success that was unlikely. 
Um, and I think that everything we're talking about, bringing people together, that's what art should be. So that's how I approach my art. And it was just kind of, I was perplexed by this idea that ballet is so isolated in terms of the people that should be a part of it. And it's an art form, so why shouldn't that be a place, a space where everyone can come together and be a part of it and enjoy it? So that's kind of just how I approach my art. Um, I think that everyone should be open to being a part of it. Um, and that truly is, I think, what Americans and America represent. So I think that's what I am. I'm a vessel to sharing the stories of so many African Americans that have come before me and succeeded and um, haven't really been given the platform to share their success. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, there's this, there's this child on the train who dances for money. Show time, show time, you know. And the culture of that child is what I represent. The American culture of that child is what I represent. I wish I could be as Latino as somebody would, you know. I wish I could dance salsa on stage as much as they would like me to. I wish I could speak as much Spanish as they would like me to, but unfortunately that didn't happen in my journey as an American storyteller. I represent uh, American Latinos who are fourth, fifth generation American Latinos who are assimilated to American and black culture. Uh, because we are, we do represent black culture, especially in the Northeast Latinos, the Caribbean, Puerto Rican, Dominican styled Latinos. Uh, and to me, that's the story I want to tell. Those are the characters I want to represent, as well as uh, even the fictional style characters of that world. And I also want to represent that in the audience, more importantly. I want to see them in the audience. I want to tell their stories, and I want those characters in the world to know that somebody's telling their stories in a live form mm -hmm. and not just in television. And I think the relationship between uh, an audience and a live play is really special and there's a lot of healing in that and there's a lot of reflection in that. And the theater, again, is the only place, truly the only place where you can be scarred and really beautiful at the same time. And I think we need to see that about ourselves more often. Um, Lemon has created an art piece, this beautiful performance piece on video, um, and he just mentioned that he wrote it in one day. Is that right? And then that's usually the turnaround. It was. It was just. It was well, on demand. It was on demand. And <laughs> anyways, it is. It's really quite. Um, I think the right thing to continue to spark the conversation, which I think art does best. Um, so we're going to show you and share an excerpt from Lemon Anderson's 2014 in review, "The Future Is in Color." Let's take a look at that. Were you there from the beginning to behold the revolution unforeseen? to bear witness to a monumental year in the history of the world like that of the year 2014. Did you dance? Did you see the love? Did you cry? Did you watch democracy contradict itself again and again and again live right before our very eyes? And yet we danced on the front line with our fiancés, partied with our familias to Beyonce and Mr. West. And yet we were still there after the party was over on both sides of the Mexican border for the undocumented in protest. The early year brought Oscars and with the Pharrell brought happy songs and a pin with the black rose on behalf of brothers keepers, sons and brothers of the concrete jungle where the black rose grows. And while our favorite Uncle Phil was walking up his stairway to heaven below, Jay-Z brought truth by shining out a number, proposition number 47. Because more schools means way less prisons, more education, better odds, healthy communities to live in, more love, more justice, and justice shouldn't discriminate. This year, it became more legal to love whoever you want to love in so many more states. For holy is the matrimony, devotion shouldn't be defined. For truth to go pop, to march for a last breath became the new state of mind. Rockin' power letter label T's, bringing more awareness to the world. Less tagging ratchetness, more tagging black lives.
thank you so much for sharing that, Lemon. Um, when we spoke earlier about this conversation and you just talked about the healing that can happen, the reciprocity between artists and audience, but you used the word service in our conversation, which I think the world can use more of. Um, talk about how we as artists, as arts presenters, can really activate service that does effect change. I love teaching. I love doing great work on stage and off stage. I believe that uh, both should be served well. I love being in a classroom where I can teach a young person uh, how to tell a story from the mentors that taught me uh, and sharing that knowledge, sharing the knowledge I've gotten from Oscar Eustace and, and Spike Lee. I don't hold back. I give away that information quickly to young people. I want them to see mastery. I want to be in the classroom. I want to be in the neighborhood. I want to be close. I want to be close to those people who feel like they don't belong in the theater. And I want to tell them that there's a place here. And I want to show them their story. And I want them to be inspired. Uh, it's not enough for us to book a school trip to the theater. We have to go into the classrooms. We have to teach excellence. We have to be the, uh, that example in the classroom. And then we show them what we do on stage. And then that's, that's the, the double blow, right? You know, it's like, wow, I, you know, he plays at this level. Or she, she performs at this level. And she was there for me in the classroom. I think there's something really special in that. And it is a, there's a, you know, there's a, a real relationship with the student uh, who doesn't feel like they belong in those institutions. Or the person that doesn't feel like that's not a place for them because it's so intimidating, you know, the theater. When you walk by the structure and the architecture of the theater, it doesn't feel like you belong there. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best to break that cycle of not coming into those. That is the place for us to be. So. And now this video is on YouTube, so I would encourage you to check it out. Um, but at the, at the end of it, you have uh, a join the movement, this call to the audience, join the movement to uplift our young people of color. Um, now, many arts organizations across the U.S. are going after younger audiences, this millennial audience, and then more ethnically diverse audiences. I want to ask all of you, um, you know, so I'd say for decades now there has been an aim and a goal to really uh, think about ways that we can be inclusive, to think about ways that we can represent this extraordinary, exquisite diversity of our nation and our globe. How do we get that right? I mean, I, I think it depends on what it is you're talking about and um, what art form it is or whatever it is that we're trying to do. I think, um, again, existing in, in the world that I do, in the ballet world, it's so separated and um, it's been isolated forever from its origin. And I think it's been just extremely difficult to have someone that has a voice outside of the ballet world who can communicate to um, a diverse group. And I think it's important for um, that, that underprivileged minority community to be represented in the theater, in that space where they feel they don't belong. Um, so it's, it's, for ballet, I feel like it's just now starting. Um, and I'm gonna just, you know, I get, I get a lot of criticism about why are you constantly talking about race? You know, you're, you're a dancer, you're a beautiful dancer, you're not a, you're not a beautiful black dancer. And it's like, I'm gonna continue to say this until, you know, I can't speak anymore because until change happens, you have to continue to talk about it. Yeah, that's, that's, um, because that's, I sometimes think about where, so, born in 1975, thinking about where jazz music was in 1975, then 20 years earlier, where it was in 1955, then 20 years earlier than that, 1935, then 20 years earlier than that, 1915, and then 20 years earlier than that, Scott Joplin, 1895, right? So where the music continued to function in the society that it was, that, that kind of fed it, that gave it its nutrients, right? generation after generation, so here we are in 2015, and there's music playing right now somewhere, somebody's playing some standard in some hotel lobby, 
or some club in Japan, you know, people are playing the music. And this is supposed to be, this is what's inspiring about it. But somehow, sometimes the stories get detached from, from the narrative of the music, you know, the narrative of its origin, or the, even the narrative of the, of the performer. Uh, and part of, I think, the goal is, is, to, is to communicate with the audience that I'm trying to develop with the Kennedy Center or any venue that I'm working with, is develop that way that an audience that walks in and hears what could sound like to some people a bunch of noise happening all at the same time. People just talking over each other and how do they know when to shut up and how do they know when to start. That's what people think about jazz. Um, <laughs> the people who are laughing, they believe that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But, um, and so there's a really, there's, it's really abstract. It's very abstract. And so how do we as Americans who supposedly, I think, promote abstraction, you know, and abstract thinking, how can they start to then make sense of the narrative that musicians for generations have told, attached to their culture, you know, attached to the roots of the culture, the freedom in the music, you know, coming from musicians like Max Roach, who's fighting for freedom in the music, Charles Mingus, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Billie Holiday. These people are not just singing a song. It's not just a song to them. And so how does an audience understand that it's more than what they think it is, right? And how can they be inspired, inspired to the, point, to the point that when they leave the space that they then try to dig deeper, you know? Or they ask someone who's walking out, yo, I didn't really understand what I just heard. Can you help me, you know? And they say, and hopefully the person says, oh, well, go back and hear the same band tomorrow night. They're gonna play something different. You know, and it's just an offer, like we talk about making sure that people can continually come into the space. It's not just the one-time school visit. You gotta go 20 times during a season, you know? There's all these empty seats in most of these theaters half the time. Why? Why are they empty besides price, besides money? But why else are they empty, you know? And uh, one thing I tried to do in San Francisco is I decided to put a skateboard ramp in a concert hall and my band played while these beautiful skateboarders skated back and forth. This was amazing. And you know who showed up? Parents of skaters. <laughs> so it was parents of kids who are 12 years old who love skateboarding. And the parents kind of like jazz, but they also like skateboarding too. And so I would never anticipated that audience coming to a show, but it was, it was mind blowing to see that kind of intensity from an audience just stare, and staring at people fall for an hour and a half. <laughs> it, it, not only did they fall, but they all got up. And the metaphor was just, it was so powerful that, that I thought, oh, this is beyond what I am imagining. But that, I think, is the power that presenters have, working with artists and, and finding funding and finding audience. And, and it really is a team, a team effort. And when you talk about, Jason, that next generation, um, uh, Misty, there is a mantra in your book. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read uh, Misty's Life in Motion, this memoir, it's just beautiful. Um, if, if, could you read just this short, um, she knows I'm asking her to read this, it's not a story. <gasps> but this short, <laughs> this short passage, um, because in essence, it's a, a beautiful call to the next generation. So I'll let you take it away. Outside the largest crowd I have ever seen waits. Prominent members of the African American community and trailblazers in the world of dance who have seldom received their due are here tonight. Arthur Mitchell, Deborah Lee, Star Jones, Nelson George. But I know I will also dance for those who aren't here, who have never seen a ballet who pass the Metropolitan Opera House but cannot imagine what goes on inside. They may be poor like I have been, insecure like I have been, misunderstood like I have been. I will be dancing for them too, especially for them. This is for the little brown girls. I stand in the furthest upstage wing when the curtain rises. There are a flock of firebirds who enter the stage first after Yvonne the Prince. I can feel the anticipation rolling off the crowd as they pose and preen. They expect me to be among them. I take a deep breath. 
the music starts and with it comes the cheers, a great roar of love from the audience. I realize in that moment that it doesn't matter what I do on the stage tonight. They are all here for me, with me, here for who I am and what tonight represents. I run onto the stage and feel myself transform. As I approach center, my flock parts leaving me to stand alone. There's a brief second of silence before the audience erupts into applause once more, clapping so loudly I can barely hear the music. And so it begins. And Misty Copeland and Fire. This is for the little brown girls. Um, that in, there's so much power in those seven words. Um, where you're, you're bringing along the next generation. Um, you're not just moving forward in the ranks, but you're bringing along the next generation. Um, talk about what that means, not only for the next generation of artists, but those who sit in the audience who see people who look like them. Yeah, um, it's something that I've just the more I get out there and I, and I speak to young kids, um, especially with my book, um, I have realized how powerful it is and something that I think a lot of children don't even realize um, when they're able to see someone that they can connect with, um, that, that they, can, can, they can start to dream and it, there are no boundaries. And it's so important to, to meet these older African-American women at this point, and they come to me and they say, I wish I had someone like you when I was growing up. Who knows, maybe I would have been the first Misty Copeland. Um, but it, that's the hardest thing for me, is that something so simple as them seeing someone like them or just not being told no could have changed the path of their lives. Um, and something that you were saying, I think it's so, important to um, give back with what we're learning and our life experiences as artists. And I know that in the dance world it's very different and, and it's, um, it can be very selfish, I think, being an artist. And I think you kind of have to be at certain points to get to that place. Um, and I know so many incredible artists that don't want to give away their secrets of how they, you know, their ways of thinking or approaching a role. And um, I definitely think the complete opposite way. Like the art form's not going to grow, it's not going to get better if we don't give away our secrets so that they can then build on that and, and be better. So it, it's just important. Lemon. Um a childhood friend of yours is quoted as saying, he took all that dirt and he just stood on top of it. I just love that quote. Um, tell us from the very beginning how the art shaped your journey. Interesting. I was telling Miss, Misty earlier that I started off in ballet. With, uh, yeah, I was, I, was the, I was a street dancer. I was discovered. My mother didn't allow us to change the channel growing up, so we, it stood on PBS. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I watched Masterpiece Theater at a really young age in the projects in Brooklyn, you know? And uh, I kind of knew these terms like demi-plie, and this guy came to my school looking for dancers for the Feld Ballet School. And I knew the term demi-plie, and he said, you're in, <laughs> you know? And I trained at, at, the, at the Feld Ballet for 18 months, and I learned a lot about art and grace and space, and it was the first time I was out of the hood, and 
and I saw these sprung floors and endless mirrors and tall ceilings, and, and it never left me. No matter what I went through, I lost my mother at a young age, like many young men and women uh, in my neighborhood, if not across the world, to HIV and AIDS. And that's an American story, if not an international story. And, uh, but I never left the world of art, the arts. It, ever since that failed ballet school, it just stood with me. And even as a performer, even on Deaf Poetry Jam on Broadway, I told Russell Simmons, I don't use microphone stands. I'm a mover. I use my body. He was like, everyone uses their body now. You know, that's what he said to the others. So all the other slam poets were like, what do you mean? What, what, what? I'm used to this microphone stand, man. What's going on? Well, Lemon is doing it. You guys got to do it, right? <laughs> and so I had to teach these guys how to use their bodies. And these guys are like stiff and liberal. And they're like, oh, Lemon, you should have been who hired you, right? <laughs> and so, uh, but I taught them a lot about space and, and how, does, how, does, how does it look like from the stage? And then I, I've always used my body, but it was, it was, the arts never really left me. And, and even telling my story when my friend said, I stood on top of that dirt, I might have stood on top of that dirt and pirouetted a little, you know, I did a pirouette. <laughs> As a G, see, though, as a G, as a G. I just want to see a, I want to see a demi plie. Oh, uh, in these boots, I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> I still got it. Well, let Misty be the judge yes. of that. <laughs> no, thank you, Lemon. Thank you. Misty, talk, I'm going to ask you that same question, um, how you talk about it in the memoir, how you, know, you came from challenging circumstances, and the arts really became a defining part of your journey. Yeah, I was having this conversation, it might have been yesterday, I don't know when it was, but um, that I just, I can't quite wrap my head around public schools wanting to take away the arts. And I, <laughs> I feel like, those people must have never been a part of an art form um, because my, my experience has just been that what I've learned and, and just taken from ballet has completely changed the way I approach my life. So it's not just about, um, you know, for me, I, I was a good student. And um, I was a Virgo, I am a Virgo, so I'm a little bit crazy about being perfect all the time. So even though I didn't enjoy being in school, I was gonna push myself to get good grades. But I don't think I was actually learning. And I don't think that it was the right forum for me. I needed a different approach and ballet was that for me. And I'm constantly being asked, you know, oh, you speak so well, you're so poised, and where did you go to college? And I was like, well, I didn't. Um, but I feel like so much of what I learned is because of my art form, and it's just made me a better communicator. Um, I never spoke before ballet. I was just terrified, and it just made me like a complete person. So it's just, it, I feel like everyone needs to experience it at some point, even if it's not something that you're going to make a career out of. And yeah, I just want to say, oh, I, yeah. I love going to the ballet, like looking like this. <laughs> I really do. You know, I was at Spoleto Festival two years ago, and I went to see Ballet Hispanico, and I was just so g. I I was like, you know, sitting next to all the old folks, and I just, you know, do the scent like, I'm watching the ballet like this, you know? <laughs> you know, that kind of look, right? You know, it's just like, that's the beauty of, like, the audience. and. and there is a space for us there at the ballet. There's a, this is such a beauty in dance as well, you know, that we need to be in touch with. We need to see that. And it, it affects our work as artists when we go see dance. You, sometimes you're looking to feel more empathetic as an artist. Just go see ballet. It'll do it to you. So. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this notion of genre busting and crossing disciplines, but I want to go to what I think is the epitome of uh, someone coming together with a new art form, and that is Jason Sound Scoring Selma, the motion picture film that's out. Um, <laughs> certainly, um, certainly a coming together of multiple points of view and forms. We're going to take a look at a trailer, and then I want to dig a little bit into that creative process. Let's take a look. The people! The people! 
There are 70 million people watching. These pictures are going around the world. We must make a massive demonstration. White, black, and otherwise. Come to some. I heard about the attack of innocent people. I couldn't just stand by. Looks like an army out there. And Jason, you had an opportunity to work with the director and other musicians, and I want to just ask about what are the nuggets, because that's a huge scale project. What are the nuggets you can take away, that you've taken away that you could share with us on that coming together with other musicians and that collaborative creative process? What just made it really work and made it click together? Sure. Um, I mean, each project that I embark upon is totally different, so I try to start with Clean Slate. But, you know, uh, many years of my life here in New York were spent with my now wife, Alicia Hall Moran, and we spent time going to the Met Opera because she's a classical singer over and over and over again. And watching narratives, you know, unfold by Puccini or Verdi or whomever, you know, over and over again. See a new production, let's go see Baird. And so after years of watching this, which I think is the great collaborative form, you know, opera where you have costume, you have lights, you have movement, you have text and you have an orchestra, you know, and you have characters, you know, each different and crazy and incestuous and murderous and, you know, it's like the great drama. And so when getting into film and working with Ava on this, she was very uh, conscious of where she stood in relationship to the history uh, and to her place in, in kind of documenting this history or making this film. Um, she's from Compton, she's about 42, you know. And so just even in that clip, you hear Public Enemy, the hip hop group, Public Enemy, over this history. Now, that wasn't what the music was in 1964, you know? Uh, but it's that kind of rub of generations kind of looking at a subject, which is where we wanted to start our conversation from. And so I started to send her music that was, that I thought embodied some of those forms. So how does rural music meet the orchestra, you know? So how does the accordion come into the orchestra? Or how does the tambourine enter an orchestra? You know, and these things that I think are so much about, about black folk music here in America that have, you know, kind of been the bedrock of what jazz and blues is built off of, then how do those things kind of find their way in navigating this very complex story, not only about that time, but about this time? And where and how can we, you know, and she was pretty, a great person to work with because not only would she accept the first idea, but she was looking for your eighth idea. And she would still come back to the first idea and say, well, this one was close, but can you try it again? And, and what I loved about that was it forced me to kind of go back to the table over and over again. And, you know, and the film is the film. The film is powerful. The film is tragic. The film also leaves a lot of hope. And what I wanted to have my orchestra do throughout the course of this two hours was by the time you enter this last speech that it's not resolved yet. We don't resolve, I don't go to a powerful one chord. No, I keep it on the edge, you know? It's very subtle what happens in the film, but I think it, I was uh, really honored and grateful to be a part of helping tell this story. Beautiful, thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up, um, and then we're going to end uh, with a question to our panel. But we do want to hear from you. We think of you as our partners in this conversation. And we do want to hear from you. So we, I believe we have mics um, in the aisles. And so if you have a question, we do ask that you keep it brief so we can hear from as many people as possible. But for Lemon, Misty, or Jason, um, if you'll just come to the mic. Do we have someone here? Okay. If you'll just state your name and ask your question, please. My name is Rada Angelova. Thank you for being here. Um, I recently read an interview with 
a ballet dancer and <laughs> I don't remember her name and I don't remember who she danced for, but she was retiring and what stood out to me is uh, she said, you know, my husband always tells me <laughs> I'm a ballet dancer third, I'm a dancer second, and I'm an artist first. And so <laughs> it kind of made a big impact on me, this statement. And so I would like to hear from the ballet dancer uh, here, do you agree with this statement and what's the difference between these three things? Thank I, you. Yeah, I think that's Wendy Whalen you might be talking about, <laughs> who just um, retired from New York City Ballet. Um, well, she is all of those things and definitely an artist first. And I think when you get to that level of being a principal dancer with an elite ballet company, you have to be an artist first and foremost. Um, it's, you get to that point where it's not about the technique um, that's no longer number one, which most dancers are focused on, most ballet dancers. You train every single day of your life um, for that technique to be effortless so that you can then become an artist and tell a story with an effortless technique that you're not even thinking about. Um, so I am a soloist and I am just now reaching that point where I am doing principal roles um, and I would say I'm an artist. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any more questions from our audience? Okay, we have someone coming to the mic. Hi, uh, my name is Taylor Rambo. I'm, I'm a student at the University of Miami Frost School of Music uh, studying arts presenting. Um, as a musician, I, uh, I see that you draw on a, a huge uh, range of musical experiences. It's incredible to hear that your interests range everything from you know rap music and how it can be connected to you know today's population and all the way back to opera so how does that influence your music creation in that film and how does that um, synthesis um, and this could be for any of you how does that impact your artistry and how you take all kinds of different genre and you merge them together into what becomes your art right. no, class called application at, at conservatories uh, because I think that's what, say if I would look at a photo of Duke Ellington playing at the Savoy Ballroom and there's a band in full costume behind beautiful music stands with beautiful lights and 16 dancers in full costume in front of them, you know, and an audience full of well-dressed people and well-dressed dancers. Uh, so that's a scene. That's not just some music, it's a scene. And sometimes when creating a, a piece, I'm looking to make the scene, the context for the conversation that the music is a part of, you know? Um, and I think I've just fallen in love with so many artists of various disciplines who were able to, to manage this as well. Um, and always looking for the, the people, maybe outside of the jazz world, who are who are engaged by what jazz offers as a medium, uh, whether it's a visual artist who makes a very conceptual video about you know, free jazz movement in the 1960s, you know, and they put it in a museum. It's not in a jazz club, it's in a museum in Germany, you know, and then it travels to Sydney, Australia. And so where does the music sit? The music doesn't just sit in these concert halls or these jazz festivals. It sometimes sits in elevators, it sits in many restaurants, you know, uh, it sits in many clubs, right? And so I'm always looking for where that relationship is. You know, the reason I did a jazz and skateboarding event was because when I was growing up skateboarding, many, jazz, many skateboarding videos in the late, early 90s and late 80s had jazz. John Coltrane would be the, the, the music you would hear with this skateboarder skating up and down San Francisco. So wait, how did those two things meet? And there are just many examples through history that I thought managed that so well that for myself to be considered an artist, I was supposed to do that too. Not only to make a good product, but inspire the person who shows up who's 12 or 13 and say, you know, I saw some crazy stuff last night, but I could do something better than that. Yes, please go do something better 
than what I did. You know, so I'm also looking for that, just the, the way to, to kind of stir up the conversation so that people can go out and create something else. Does anyone else want to feel that question? I know, I know skateboard. I know the skateboard uh, from the '80s and '90s, man. You, Paul Peralta. I think people don't see that relationship uh, with people of color as well. That we have an American relationship to those cultures. Uh, I think that we're just pinned into this corner, and we have to speak this certain way. But I know those those yeah. films, and I know that music really well, and I know Gleaming the Cue and. And Natus Corpus and Vision Skateboards. Yes. I was there with you, man. Yes, so. yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, we'll take a final question from this side. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Kareem Bear. I'm from San Francisco, and I feel like we've we're doing a better job about talking about diversity and audiences on the stage, um, but I feel like we still have a long way to go to talk about how we empower people of color um, to move into curatorial positions, senior administrations, senior administrative positions. So I'd like to hear what your thoughts are, both on um, encouraging people of color to pursue this as a career, but also to us as administrators um, to start identifying and helping to cultivate more people of color in these um, positions, because I feel like we're lopsided if we're talking about diversity in the theater and on the stage, but we're not talking about it with our staff. I'll feel that and then pass it if that's fine. You know, I have, um, at our CEO at NPR has this saying, um, whoever's talking around the water cooler, they're deciding the stories that are going to be told. So I would say that it's, it's really important that we begin to diversify um, those who are making decisions about which arts are being presented, that we begin to diversify our arts administration field. Um, and I know as, a, as an executive producer, I, I feel a responsibility as an African-American executive producer, sometimes the only one in an organization, sometimes the only one in a 90-year history of an organization, to ensure that I'm mentoring and or hiring and or training those who are going to come after me so that the sensibility that the DNA of the curatorial vision really is um, exclusive and represents the full breadth of not only our nation but our world as well. Yeah, I think that's great. So I, I love that question, but I, I definitely want to say that we need more numbers. <laughs> it, it's about a lifestyle, and I, I want to make this quick. Uh, theater has to be a lifestyle for people of color so that people have to watch theater and say, I want to be inspired to be an administrator, or I want to be inspired not to be just the actor on stage, but I like the lighting design. That's, that, that's my calling. Uh, and we have to create more opportunities for theater to become a lifestyle so that there are more people watching theater, so there are more people interested in working in theater. Until we see that, we're not going to have those kind of numbers that we would like. Why? Because at the end of the day, you are competing for a job. And you want to hire the best. And I'm not saying that there's not opportunities out there and there's not really talented uh, administrators of color or diversity, but there's not enough to compete. And I see it because I work in this world. We need more people to compete. We need more people of color to compete. We need, we need more diversity, because at the end of the day, we want to do great jobs. We just don't want the job. We want to do great jobs. That's it. I don't want to hire someone who's not good at their job, because we cool. <laughs> I'm going to get fired. <laughs> and so I need more people to compete for that job, more people of color to compete for that role, more people of color to compete for that writing, for that, you know, and then it serves itself. I like that lifestyle. Yeah. That makes yeah. lifestyle change and a, and a choice that this is, this is not just like, oh, this person is popular right now, so I'm going to go to the theater and see them, but it's something that you continue to do. But I think it's <laughs> educating the parents, educating teachers. You know, I'm approached by so many African-American um, parents who are who say, or even teachers who are not of color and they say I don't know how to talk to the student who's black I don't know how to tell them how to deal with their hair how to get their hair to go into a classical bun 
Um, and it's about educating everyone involved so that it creates an atmosphere where we are feeling that we are accepted um, and it's like a warm environment. Um, my final question for the three of you. So we have this incredible room full of people who live and breathe and think and plan art all the time. If you had a magic wand and could, we would do your bidding, what would you have us to do? In, in 20 words or less, no, no, not 20, 20 words. 20 words or less words. What would you have us to do? Give us money. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, my mine might be attached to that because it was make everything free. <laughs> make everything free. Well, see, here's the thing, right? You know, the hardest for me is I'm a play, I'm a playwright, right? A lot of people I follow I follow the tradition of poet playwright. I'm a spoken word artist, but I am in the tradition of poet playwright, which is Tennessee Williams, T. S. Eliot, August Wilson. I am in that tradition. Uh, in order to really write these plays, it takes time. And sometimes it we, you have, we have to put in six or seven plays before we're discovered, and by then it, it's 30 years down the road. I think you should, if I had to mat, put a magic wand, as I say, try to discover these writers at a younger age and develop them there, and pay for their time there and develop them, because the last thing you want to think about while you are trying to use your imagination to execute drama is your bills. And are there any final thoughts or words you haven't had a chance to share, but you just have to get it out before our final few minutes end? Any final words you want to share with this audience? You know, just I thought when you brought up the idea of about schools and their relationship to, to, to the arts, this was where I started and I went from kindergarten through 12th grade through public schools learning about music the entire time and going to a performing and visual arts in Houston and really getting such an education that by the time I arrived here at Manhattan School of Music, I was two years ahead of everybody else who showed up here. That's how amazing the public education system was with music. And if there's anything that we have a job to do as presenters is really engage our, our districts that have these schools, that have these kids, and that have these instruments, whether it's two or 20, and really get everybody charged up about it because that's that is our future those are the future curators those are the future directors dancers musicians everybody uh, that's just it is the is a pivotal part of the fabric of this country and the world depends on the fabric of this country artistically it just continues to do that so if we just messing up our fabric with some crappy nylon we have job to do to get silk right you know cotton right you know that's my thing. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think that it's definitely, again, important to involve all levels um, when you're talking about, you know, getting people of color to be on the board of directors or be the people at the top. It has to start from the bottom. And um, I think it takes educating again, educating our parents, the parents of these children, educating the teachers, and um, just really giving these students an opportunity to be a part of every art form. Um, and if that's in public schools or at places where I started at the Boys and Girls Clubs, but um, it's just so important, I think, to start at a young age in order to really develop what our future holds in the arts. Lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. I truly believe that the future of, of the arts is going to have more diversity if we start to create a lifestyle that we're comfortable with going to the theater, going into that space. It's a very intimidating space. And I believe that we should service our community by saying, you are always welcome here. We should always tell the community that they're always welcome here. Uh, because it took the theater for me to say, for me to see that I can be scarred. It's okay. Not rap music. It took the theater. 
And so we need to welcome those scarred human beings, those young children, into a space where you, you know, they can see. My, you know, I just want to end on this. I didn't go to see Into the Woods. That wasn't my first musical. Sarafina was. So you see that what happened? I was, I was like, oh, wow. I, didn't, I had no idea that struggle can be danced on stage. Good for me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And we'll, we'll end with the bookcase of the Porter quote, the arts. They are what we find again when the ruins are cleared away. Ladies and gentlemen, Lemon Anderson, Misty Copeland, and Jason. <laughs>
Um, uh, next slide, please. On the special events and the rental side, uh, we've got a full service division run by Carl Schlossman. Uh, we do 4,100 events annually, uh, another 1.6 million attendees. Uh, gross revenues exceed 80 million. Uh, and, you know, we co promote and rent our venues to uh, national and regional promoters, you know. God forbid I say AEG, but also, you know, the, the other promoters out there, whether it's Outback or NS2. Um, and we've got a network of relationships with Fortune 1000 clients and marketing and advertising agencies around the country. Next slide, please. Um, another area we feel we are best in class in is in marketing. We spend over $15 million in, in marketing annually around the country. Um, we have the largest live event marketing database in, in the world via Ticketmaster.com and LiveNation.com. One of the areas we, we, we really focus on, and it's where marketing is going today, is our, our digital marketing. We have devoted teams of digital marketing teams to assist in Google and Facebook advertising, as well as retargeting and prospecting. Um, expertise in traditional media, of course. We have over 50 marketers around the country. Uh, and then another area we focus on a great deal, especially our clubs and theaters, is the community with dedicated teams for social management, uh, as well as digital agencies. So that's why we're here today. Uh, to talk about uh, some of the things that we've been doing and based on our scale and national footprint uh, we've been working with PACs around the country um, to augment their efforts and improve their content and operations. We've developed a suite of products and, and opportunities that we'd like to present with you and so Ben will take you through those right now. Thank you uh, and we'll, we'll keep this quick. Um, and I appreciate there's a whole cross-section of the industry here. There's a, uh, agents and managers and promoters and producers and venues, and obviously we're, we're, we're venue-focused and, and promoter-focused. Um, so hopefully some of this resonates with you, but um, you know, one option is the exclusive talent buying and marketing option. Um, you know, we become the exclusive promoter for your venue. Uh, and we utilize our marketing assets, our proprietary data, and our booking team uh, to help sell more tickets and to help book more content. Um, as I said, you know, we, we, we're, we work with national and regional promoters, so we're not looking to cut out um, anybody. In fact, we're looking to actually, you know, grow the business um, hand in hand you know, with, uh, with your teams as well. And your venue would be immediately become part of our portfolio and all the discussions that we have uh, with agents and managers every day. Uh, that's option number one. That's the pretty simple one. We're buying talent and we're helping market. Uh, the next slide uh, is, is more of, of, of the deeper relationship, what we call the full service solution. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, the packs out there, a lot of the theaters are, are, are nonprofits that are operating at a loss, and, and, and we really feel that with our best in class teams uh, operating venues, increasing revenues through upsells and VIP opportunities, uh, special events and rentals, helping increase subscriptions and, and, and maximizing concessions that um, we can at the very least help reduce the loss uh, that that a lot of these uh, 501c3s have on have on their books and and, and God forbid um, make some money uh, while we're at it for you guys as well um, and we do appreciate that, that there is not you know necessarily a, a one-size-fits-all approach um, so hopefully we can just craft the partnership that works for you works for us and you know put more butts in seats sell more tickets and uh, put more shows on your calendars and um, I just appreciate your guys time and thank you for letting us talk and I'm ready to head to the bar. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Live Nation. So I know you're ready to enjoy the reception. Uh, when you see these representatives and all of the Live Nation group, please thank them. So enjoy and have a lovely, lovely, bright evening. Thank you all.